Hey everyone, welcome to a new video. I hope you had a great day. Let's take a look at some new malicious compliance stories, shall we? The first story is called, you want a ticket? I work at a big online company that does lead generation for real estate and prior to 2020 I was working on our tech support team. But for one reason or another, they decided to move me and my teammates to the success team, a similar job but less techy. This happened on March 16th, the day we became work from home. Now I realized pretty early on that I was never actually removed from any of the support world's access. I could still view things I shouldn't, like how many tickets they had open. In my day we would finish all of our tickets in a day, to the point where we would watch Netflix and fight over inbound calls. At this time they had over 3000 open tickets. I'm a very nice person, very customer oriented. So instead of adding to the ticket queue and making the customers wait a month or two for an answer if they called us, I would try to resolve the issue now if I could. But not this customer. This customer called in screaming. I'm good with de-escalation, I tried to explain that I could help if she would let me. I tried to explain that I used to be part of the tech team, heck I even tried giving her the phone number because that is a faster way of getting help. But no, she just kept screaming at me to put a ticket in for her because she is having notification issues and she needs a ticket put in because the notifications aren't working. Why she couldn't put the ticket in herself I have no idea, but you know what ma'am? Sure, absolutely. There you go, I just put the ticket in and I'm sure the tech team will get to it as soon as they can. They were 6 weeks behind in answering tickets at that point. I have no idea what happened beyond that since it is a fairly big company, but I'm sure she called and screamed at someone else when the ticket wasn't answered right away. Still made me laugh though, because her issue was a fairly easy one to fix that I could actually have fixed for her in about 5 minutes if she would have let me. But instead I did what she asked and put in a ticket. The next story is called Just Plug A String. This happened around 10 years ago. Back then I was called upon to sit in as a bass player on a recording session for a Mercy Beat influenced song for a singer-songwriter who was still forming a touring band. The singer-songwriter had a certain sound in mind which needed a really fat vintage bass tone that was used in the 60s. I happened to have the right tool for the job, a Gibson EB2 from the mid 1960s. So I got a call since the singer-songwriter heard I had that bass and asked if he could loan it or even better if I wanted to play on the session. It was easy money with no further obligations, so I agreed. So I arrived at the session with my bass and caught cheat sheet and noticed everything was already installed, so it was plug and play. Nowadays a bass line is recorded as a double track. The signal from the instrument is split, with one line going straight into the mixing console and the other one is going through an amplifier that has a microphone. Then when mixing the song, both signals are blend, so you have articulation from the direct line and character from the mic signal. So I took my bass, tuned it silently with a clip-on tuner, plugged it straight in the amp, twiddling the knobs to get a fairly neutral sound, making sure I first put the master volume at zero and then slowly up. Meanwhile the recording the engineer that day tossed me an X for cable and junction box that I needed to place between my bass and the amplifier, so he could run the clean signal straight in the table. That engineer had a bit of a pretentious air surrounding him, pretending to know it all and bossing the musicians around, belittling them at the same time. He took a look at my bass, rolled his eyes and said that a modern music man would be better suited and was more versatile instead of that alt hack that probably sounded like a turd. The alt hack Gibson EB2 was a very popular bass back in the 1960s, but nowadays it has faded a bit into obscurity. It's a one trick pony, but it absolutely excels at this soul trick, producing absolutely gargantuan levels of low end frequency. Don't expect any clarity, articulation or finesse from it. On top of that, it has an extremely high signal output, dwarfing even the output of active instruments with onboard amplifiers. The pickup responsible for that all has earned a nickname of its own, the mud bucker, because all it does is producing mud. Back in the days, those Gibson EB basses had a reputation of being able, with normal use, to fry almost any loudspeaker within minutes just by their sheer power. So I was ready and the engineer, who since had retreated to the control room, told me to play something to get the levels right. Via the talkback mic I told him that I already adjusted the amp to my liking but that I advised him to turn the volume of the direct line to zero on his side and turn it up slowly. I was rather rudely interrupted that he knew what he was doing and that I just needed to plug a string so we could get on. So that's what I did, I plucked the string. 
At that very moment, I saw his eyes basically pop out of his sockets and he frantically mashed a button on the mixing console. I don't know what happened at the other side of that window, but I'm fairly sure that the EB2 claimed the life of two rather expensive studio speakers. The session itself was nothing special. One playthrough as a rehearsal, four takes and it was a wrap. I didn't stick around for the playback, but I heard from the singer-songwriter that he had to initially listen to the track via headphones and not via the speakers in the control room. I received a final mix a few weeks later, but the singer-songwriter decided to shelf the song with it not really fitting the rest of his material. The Gibson got sold a few years later, as it was a bit too valuable to keep in relation to its usage. The last story is called Her Salt Free Diet. This story is from a dinner party I hosted a few years ago. I invited six folks and shortly after the invites were sent, I received a call from Sally. Sally, not her real name, advised me that she was now on a salt-free diet due to medical reasons. She advised that at home she cooked without any salt and gave me a speech about how wonderful salt-free life was. I was skeptical and advised her that I would personally find it difficult to give up all salt. Was she sure she wasn't just on a low-sodium diet? Sally advised that unless her dish was salt-free, she wouldn't be attending. While telling her no was an option, I'm not that person. I had problems with her for years for being difficult at the dinner table and restaurants. Trust me, there was always something wrong with her meal, or its preparation, or the flavor, or the waiter, or something else. With a smile so large you could hear it through the phone, I assured her that her request for salt-free was 100% going to be accommodated. On dinner night, I prepped the meal. Sally was getting the same thing as everyone else, with one critical difference. All of her food was prepped in separate containers, baked on separate racks and seasoned with exactly the same flavors, sand salt. Dinner time and my guests arrive. I have all of Sally's food plated on white plates. Everyone else gets grey plates. First round, appetizers. Fried calamari with a lemon jalapeno butter sauce. This dish typically has salt in both the batter and the sauce. As Sally couldn't have that, I battered her calamari and salt-free seasonings and flour. Her condiment looked exactly the same, but was made with unsalted butter and no added salt. I placed Sally's plate in front of her first, and she immediately states she asked for salt-free. I assure her that her dish is salt-free, and I made sure to cook her separately and even use a different colored plate to keep it straight. We all sit to talk and enjoy the squid. Sally takes a bite and makes a face. Mine has no flavor, she exclaims. All of my other guests tell Sally it's divine, delicious, best they've had, etc. I smile at Sally and assure her that her dish was flavored exactly as everyone else. The only difference is that she received absolutely no salt. It's at this point that Sally has a moment of clarity. It's painfully obvious on her face. She realizes she can't complain about the lack of salt as she has already told the table about her salt-free life. She also can't claim it tastes terrible if everyone else is raving about the food. She literally looks like she was about to cry at the table. As my guests enjoy their dinner, Sally is slowly doing the toddler place with her food munch and pushing her calamari around the plate. After a few moments, she reaches for the sauce that I made for everyone else. Sally, be careful, the salt-free sauce is in the white bowl, that one has salt. She mumbled something about wanting to taste the difference before literally dumping the bowl on her calamari. She then exclaims how much better it tasted. You and I know that, of course, things taste better with salt. So this drama repeated itself over the main course of honey roasted salmon with pine nuts. I also am no heaton and had both salt and pepper on the table for my guests. I'm not going to judge you for needing more flavor. Here we go. Sally takes a bite of her fish and once again realizes that it has no salt. She reaches for the salt shaker and the conversation stops. Another guest asks Sally if she was okay with adding salt to her food. She says that she can occasionally have salt. She proceeds to shower her fish with salt sprinkles. I also baked some cookies for dessert. The dough uses a little salt. I made sure to whip up a separate batch of cookies prepped to go for her. Salt free of course. When I handed her those cookies, the lack of defeat that hit her face warmed my heart. Dinner is over, everyone is happy, except for Sally. I called her the next week to make sure she was okay as she has consumed sodium at my party. Sally told me her doctor has removed her sodium restrictions and she won't need that accommodation at future meals. On the phone, I congratulate her on her good health. When I hang up, I laugh until my sides hurt. 
Salt-free life apparently doesn't taste good when the salt is actually omitted. To anyone on a low or no sodium diet for their health, I commend you. Sally, however, wasn't actually on this diet. This is evidenced by her shock at how salt-free food tasted. I confirmed with her husband that she has never stopped using salt at home. Her salt-free claims were a ploy for attention that backfried tastelessly. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please press the like button. It really helps in the algorithm. Have a great day. Stay safe. Bye bye.